Dylan and I got introduced by the TypeScript team, uh, which is kind of another story to tell. Um, and you know, we chatted about doing conferences because Dylan is doing a couple of conferences. Uh, then I got invited to one of his conferences and I thought, okay, let's invite him back and see what he has to talk about. So I'm really excited for Dylan Schiemann. Hello. Um, it's really nice to be in a country where people know how to pronounce my name. So I love that. So thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is a story. It is about what happens to frameworks in a post-React apocalypse. And I didn't realize this was going to be based on a true story until my flight over here on Tuesday night. And I was watching this movie called Yesterday. How many of you have seen Yesterday? Only a few, and that's really sad. So Yesterday is a movie where the lead actor is a musician, and I pushed a button, and um, he is the only person in the world who remembers the Beatles after this sort of post-apocalyptic event happens. And um, so things are really strange. Well, not apocalyptic, but... And um, it's really interesting. So this talk is very similar to that movie, but not at all. And it's about something called React that none of you now remember. So anyway, um, that's that. And I guess there was also a Star Trek episode with this premise. So the talk came to my mind about a month ago. But basically, forgetting the Beatles would be like forgetting John Rezig, Paul Irish, Ray Bango, and some other jQuery team member that you don't remember. <laughs> and honestly, we're getting to a point where a lot of people don't remember these names. Or they don't remember who they are. Most of you probably remember Paul Irish and maybe you remember Ray Bango. But these were three or four of the main people who were working on jQuery back in the day, which five years ago was the most popular library or framework on the web. And today, it's not. So they were big proponents in democratizing the web and democratizing JavaScript for developers. And that's what made jQuery so big. But today, I've been preserved from this apocalypse by this lovely mask I found on Amazon for like $20 or something. And what's happened today is the savage Ebola Angular Vue React virus <laughs> has wiped all remnants of React from our repos, our documentation, and our minds. So none of you know what I'm talking about. You're like, what is this React thing you're talking about? But luckily, I was preserved from this extinction level event. All of our websites look like this. I've turned them red to make it, you understand the gravity of the situation. Our websites have been reduced to skeleton loading pages with little boxes showing nothing. It's really catastrophic. I'm like, what's going on? And so we go and we look at the React documentation. And we see a 404 error, which I've also made look really hideous and ugly. The documentation's gone. The repos are empty. This is so... Not good. So what do we do? What do we do? We could cry, like this, this lovely person. It's amazing how many cool things you can find on the web when you're trying to create a talk at the last minute. And <laughs> so I was like, well, Marvin's here to talk, right? And Marvin's going to tell us about this amazing library. It's reactive. It has the same API as React. It's called Preact. It's smaller. Maybe it's better. How many of you use Preact? More than I expected, but none of you use Preact because you just hear about it, you know it's cool, but you're afraid to look at it. So we're going to go take a look at Preact. Damn. Those aliens have regex. <laughs> they wiped out the React from Preact. <laughs> and so that's not a choice. The same is true with Next, Gatsby, Storybook, Ionic React, and on and on. So we're like, well, all right, what do people use anymore? Like, if we can't use React or any derivative of React. So let's go look at that amazing state of JavaScript survey, which hasn't been updated this year, but there's the one from last year. And we look back, and there were four results, and there's React, Vue, Angular, and Preact. And so we're like, well, that's cool. But now we've got to update this, right? It's lovely when you can use fire animation in a slide and it feels relevant instead of gratuitous. And I have done my best to use every keynote animation effect possible to get the animations completely in your way to basically do the opposite of Lizzie's amazing talk. But this is different. This is performance, right? So, so we're down to two. We're down to Vue and Angular. And those might be good choices. Um, but you know, what's Angular like anymore? It hasn't been a while since I've used it. 
Uh, maybe we don't like it. Apologies to the Angular Austria Association. Um, I'm going to offend Angular for a moment. But you know, maybe it's not so bad now that they're on version 78 and Ivy has maybe finally arrived after all these years promising a rendering environment that's fast. Or maybe, you know, Jen Looper's here, so maybe it's time to look at Vue and get a different point of view. Um, really bad pun intended. It was awesome. I was at JSConf earlier this year, and the cafe was called the Vue Cafe. And I'm like, wow, they got really good promotional foo at JSConf this year for the framework. So, all right. So suppose we're going to look at Vue and Angular. Like, we're just going to be lazy and pick the next two most popular things. So how would we decide? Well. Maybe our new alien overlords could tell us what to choose, because that's about as good of a technique as we would normally use. And um, oddly enough, this image was the result of me searching for React and aliens, so that's why I used it. How would we react if we really found aliens? There's a nice article on space.com about that. Anyway, <laughs> but it's, it's really odd. Like, how are we going to communicate with them? Let me make sure my audio is on. There we go. So we, get, we start to listen, and we hear this really weird um, communication broadcast on the news. Kind of make it out. I'm not really sure what they're saying. Luckily, I've got Google Translate, and I'll tell you in a moment what that's about. But I just wanted to remind us that past leaders of the free world have met with aliens before. We have Obama. We have Ike. We have Hillary Clinton. There was a senator, not a president. She met up with E.T. This is all from the interweb, so it must be true, okay? Everything you find online must be true, I've, I've been told. But I could not find an image of Trump meeting a world leader, or an alien leader. Instead, all I could find was him meeting the Ukrainian leader. So that's kind of been in the news lately. And it turns out this is really relevant as I put that alien message through Google Translate. And I discovered it was a secret meeting between Evan Yu Oh, um, Misko Haveri, I can't say his name, I'm sorry, Misko. Um, he's the original Angular creator, Evan is the original Vue creator. And this alien that looks oddly like Mickey Mouse, um, but he's not Mickey Mouse, he's an alien. And they were talking, and I managed to transcribe just part of this transcript just before this. And it's eerily similar to the transcript from Trump meeting with the Ukraine president. So the other thing, there's a lot of talk about that React. Facebook stopped prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out that so whatever they can do with your alien virus would be great. Facebook went around bragging about that they stopped. It's so horrible to us. It makes no sense because it was Trump speaking, really, but, but, but this was actually the message that was sent. And so this makes me immediately suspect using Vue or Angular. And honestly, really, it's that we already know about Vue and Angular, so we'll just skip that for the purpose of this talk. But so Vue and Angular have dropped off. We can't use them in good faith. Sorry, Jen. And sorry, all the Vue and Next fans in the audience. So let's go back to our, our survey, right? And oh, there we go. And we're out of options. And in a world where this is the case, where we usually get new frameworks to choose from every day, we've managed to do something for the first time in history that's never happened before. We've managed to allow frameworks to die faster than we could create new ones. <laughs> So there's, there's been a lot of good talks this year. There was one about maybe we don't need a framework, and I, let's not get crazy. Um, <laughs> most people think they don't need a framework, then end up writing their own framework, and they generally don't know what they're doing. Not that that's a bad thing. Like A lot of great things come from trying to do something different. Um, but most people should use a framework, otherwise you'll create another one. So, so frameworks. I always like to say, well, how do you choose a framework, right? And you don't choose it because it's popular. You don't choose it because your friend's using it. You don't choose it because it's going to make your CV or resume look good. You choose it because it meets a need. And generally, frameworks are much more important on bigger projects, on projects with lots of team members, because you want to write code that's maintainable and consistent. You want something that's going to last. You want something that will be efficient, interoperable, have a focus, you know, all sorts of different opportunities, right? But really, you want to encapsulate best practices for building real-world apps that you need to build. So it's like you choose your framework based on what you're doing and who you are and what your team's strengths and weaknesses are, rather than choosing a framework and then figuring out what you're going to build with that framework. So mentioning real world, I don't mean this real world, but I mean this real world. And this is sort of the better to do MVC reference application that's out there today called the real world app. And it, it's sort of like a 
a CRUD style application that sort of puts frameworks to the test. And there's this annual blog series about it called the Real World Comparison. And what it does is it looks at all the reference implementations that are out there for different frameworks and looks at their performance. And you'll see at the top, you've got Svelte, Stencil, I'm going to ignore App Run because I only have space for three on my deck, and Dojo, which is the one that I work on, which far outperform the others on the list. And honestly, the performance doesn't really matter. It's like, hey, let's just pick three that are doing really well in this study. So we could look at these three JavaScript or TypeScript frameworks as a way to see what's out there. Now, what I'm not going to do is pick a winner, because if I was to pick a winner, I would just say, use Dojo and go home, and this talk's over. But obviously, that's not interesting, and also, that's not what I want to do. I want you to think for yourself. I want you to research like, what you want to use and why you want to use it. And so, but I will at least briefly look at what these three frameworks do or say to do. So let's look at their marketing message. So let's start with Svelte. It's cybernetically enhanced web apps, which kind of scares me given we've just gone through a post-apocalypse event. Um, and part of their description's missing, um, which, is, which is unfortunate. I don't know what they're talking about there. But, um, but really, Svelte is not so much a framework as it's a set of really nice developer tools and a nice compiler that sort of takes what feels like idiomatic web and JavaScript code, but that doesn't really work natively as written and transpiles it into code that works. So it sort of makes JavaScript reactive by default and then transpiles it to code that's actually reactive behind the scenes. But when I think of this, I'm, I'm kind of scared because um, cybernetics can go bad. So hopefully Svelte's good. Hopefully Svelte isn't behind this alien attack on React. Um, but there is also this guy named Dan that you might have heard of. But you've probably forgotten him because React doesn't exist. And um, he was kind of a big deal in the React ecosystem for a while until React died. And um, basically his point was, if you start out with a framework that claims to not be a framework, eventually it will become a framework. And what that means is, like, Every framework starts out small and lean and efficient, but then when you actually go through the process of solving all of your real-world problems, you end up with something bigger. And, it's, and Mar Marvin will talk later on about how to avoid that trap of just getting into bigger and bigger code bases that never shrink. So I will save that for his talk. Stencil is really nice. Um, it's very much focused on being a really polished way to work with web components and create design systems and component libraries that work across multiple frameworks. And Ionic uses it, Ionic React uses it, but we can't use that for this talk. And um, but basically what they've done is they've worked with web components in a way that make it manageable and usable in every browser in every framework, which is really nice. And there are a lot of people who argue that web components will replace your front-end framework. I completely disagree with that. Uh, we like web components, but I feel that they are a very rough spec to work with for building real apps. And all of the sort of things you need beyond a component are kind of left to your own devices. So like state management and routing or routing and sort of all the things that make an application architecture are missing. So unless you're just distributing a single component to a page, I don't find that web components are the answer for building applications. They're good for building single components or building smaller widgets or things that you might embed in a page. So, Dojo was started in 2004 by myself, Alex Russell, and David Schonsler, and it's the longest-lived actively maintained JavaScript library uh, or toolkit. But last year, we released our first major rewrite in 10 years, and it's now called Dojo instead of Dojo Toolkit. And what it does is it attempts to provide a TypeScript-first framework for building really nice modern small applications. And it does a lot of nice things like it gives you PWAs out of the box. It supports web components. It aligns with a lot of modern standards. And the sort of hello world application, the real world application actually for Dojo is under 20 kg zipped. And it also includes sort of your like build time rendering or static site generation tooling in the framework itself. So in many ways, it's kind of like React plus Redux plus Nuxt, but authored in TypeScript and a lot smaller than React is by default. Um, no one cares about it yet because it's really early in that growth stage. I mean, a few people care about it, um, but it's, it's still in that nice early growth stage. What's cool, though, is we, call, we don't call our components components. So we survived this, really in, uh, this alien regex that is insane. I just Googled for the largest regex I could find, and it wouldn't fit on a slide, and I turned it red. So that's how this came to be. <laughs> but 
Dojo has been around for a long time. So at the JS Conf 2013, Peter Higgins, who was an early Dojo proponent, he gave a talk called Dojo Already Did That, which was a spoof that for the first like 10 years of JS Conf, everyone would say, well, Dojo already did that. Because Dojo sort of invented like half of the things we take for granted today on the web in an earlier form. And, um, but back in the day, it was called Digit, which frankly, in hindsight, is a terrible name. But now we just call them widgets. And there was this meme such that when I would go to meet with people, this is Adi Asmani on the right, I'd go to meet with people and they'd randomly make me take photos like this with them on Twitter saying Dojo already did that, which was funny, but like, it doesn't matter, right? The point is, like, everything we talk about has probably been done before by someone, but maybe not in the same elegant way we do it today. So like, React didn't invent reactivity, it didn't invent like, components, it didn't invent any of this stuff, but it came around at a right time in history, which is basically right when IE8 died, what React does with the virtual DOM was fast enough. Before that, it consumed too much memory to be viable in early versions of Internet Explorer. But when React was first announced at the same JS Conf of 2013, the same Dojo already did that event, um, the tweets were not favorable about our whatever. Um, basically, there are, I don't know if you've seen this post, but there are just some really awesome ways of dissing React. So, Things change, opinions change, and this was only five or this is only six years ago now, right? So we've, we've gone from people thinking this was the stupidest idea ever to the thing that's the coolest thing since sliced bread to the thing everyone uses. So things shift, things change. I was at TSConf, uh, which my company organizes a couple weeks ago, and the theme for TSConf 2019 was kind of this dark city, which in many ways feels a little apocalyptic as well. Uh, how many of you like TypeScript or use TypeScript? About two-thirds, I think. I can barely see you, but I can see movement. So, um, <laughs> But basically, uh, for me, uh, TypeScript support is not just like, can I make it work? But like, does it take advantage of all of the intricate benefits of TypeScript? So I did a really random comparison of these three to look at how well they support TypeScript. And I just picked four things. Like, they're all authored in TypeScript, which is great. But Svelte doesn't really claim to be a framework for TypeScript developers. You can't really do their like, component definitions or nested components. They don't consider themselves a TypeScript-first framework. Sf uh, Stencil and Dojo are the only two modern frameworks I know of that choose to be strict in their TypeScript definitions. So Angular is not strict, um, and others as well. And Stencil and Dojo both support TSX, which is basically JSX. But luckily, we use the letter T, so we didn't get wiped out by this virus either. But there's a lot of things um, you know, that make for a good TypeScript framework. But mostly, it's like, how easy is it to actually describe the common patterns and things I would do in a language? And there are still things in React that are quite difficult, in my experience, to do with TypeScript. Though they've, Hooks has made it better, but introduced some other things that are worse. Um, but anyway, so TypeScript's cool. Uh, all of these frameworks, I think, do quite well with TypeScript. But Svelte is really not designed for TypeScript users. It's just using TypeScript to make a good framework. So what else could we look at? Well, I always like to look at big data, because big data is a totally useless term that makes me think of this. And, <laughs> and so you know, a lot of frameworks claim to be enterprise ready. They can handle big data. And the point is, like, I don't think looking at frameworks on a feature by feature level is necessarily the right way to look at how well they work. Because it's not a checklist. It's a taste, right? It's a style. It's a if I do all of these things together, are they consistent? Do they work in a logical way? Do I feel like I'm productive? Do I feel like I'm creating good code? Am I going to look at this in six months and want to gouge my eyes out? Or am I going to understand what I was trying to do? So to me, the things that really matter for frameworks are things like cohesion, right? Have I taken, do I feel like every part of my application is its own beast that's different than the other parts of my application? And that's probably React's biggest strength and weakness, is that if you use a lot of different things for React, the fact that there are a lot of different things out there is great, but the way they're created doesn't feel particularly consistent at times. I found this lovely collection of images when I searched for alignment um, apocalypse. And basically, it's a look at how different characters in post-apocalyptic movies and shows behaves in a different scale of alignment, right? But what I mean here is really how we work through by aligning things with modern standards and good patterns and best practices. So one of the complaints that web component proponents make about React is it doesn't support web components. And one of the things that React people say about web components is web components suck. And they're both right. I mean, 
Web components are an imperfect spec, but they are a nice improvement over what we had before. And so one of the things that Dojo and Stencil have tried to do is align web components and reactive components together um, in an interesting way. There's a lot of different things you can do um, to create reactivity. I would say what's interesting about Svelte and Dojo in this case is there's a lot less ceremony than there is in, say, when you're using Redux. Like, I look at Redux code, and all I see is like a whole bunch of like reduced statements that make me want to gouge my eyes out. And I'm gouging my eyes out a lot today. It's unusual. So uh, they're still here. So. Um, but the, the thought process is like if you cr like one of the complaints I would make about Angular is to make things observable, you're having to pull in RxJS everywhere. And RxJS is a really nice thing to make something reactive that's not reactive. But if you create APIs that are just reactive by default or that just reduce when they should or that just you know, follow the pattern you would expect, then you reduce a lot of boilerplate and ceremony and just get things that work the way you would expect. This was a really funny photo. I found it when searching for um, a line and the post-apocalypse as well, and it's Terminal Alliance book one of the janitors of the post-apocalypse. And I'm interested, there's more than one book about janitors of the post-apocalypse, but I'm curious to see. Has anyone read this book? I hope not, but yeah, good. <laughs> but the cover, also, all of these images I've taken are distorted in some way to make them feel apocalyptic. So it, it, actually, this one's not that different than it looked in real life. But um, the web platform is constantly evolving, right? The YCG, spelled W-I-C-G, is constantly adding new things like intersection observers and resize observers and animations and little fixes, you know, virtual scrolling and so on. And really good frameworks today are re you know, rapidly working to align themselves with standards where they can. So one of the cool things Dojo does and has done for a while, and it predates hooks, is it has this concept of like a middleware. And what the middleware in Dojo does is it, for reactive, web comp reactive components, or widgets as we call them, is say you want to do something like animate a node, or resize a node, or observe that it's come into view. Well, typically in React, that would be a painful chore to sort of say, well, all right, this isn't really VDOM stuff, so give me the real DOM and let me do something with it. And what Dojo does is it says for all these emerging standards, you mix in this, or you, know, you, you include or import this API, and now all of the things I would need to do to resize something or animate something or observe that it's moved into view are now available as reactive properties, just like anything else I would do in React or Dojo normally. And the idea is to really take that like, architectural set of patterns and apply it purely across the entire framework while leveraging all of the new standards. And I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to forget that React came out two years before ES6. And while it's changed a lot, there was a time when it didn't even use ES modules. And there was a time when it used ES6 classes because they were the new thing, right? And now they don't, or at least they don't you know, choose to admit that where they do still use them. Um, but the point is, like, a, a good framework evolves rapidly. And one of the reasons that frameworks do eventually die is that you get big and you become popular and you get stuck because you can't iterate without breaking everyone. So with Dojo, we were really popular in, like, 2009 to 2011. And then, but the thing is, we had all of this support for IE 6 through 8. And then suddenly no one cared about it and everyone stopped using it. And then we finally said, OK, we can finally rewrite and drop all this cruft we're not happy about anymore. And it's pretty rare that you can do that and then have the time to do it right again. So, um, Custom elements, part of web components, are really hard to work with in many regards because it's not just like I've got a custom element tag, but how do I pass data to it and how do I bind things reactively and so on. And so we're also still missing like HTML modules and some of those pieces. There are a lot of factors in building apps. This is a post-apocalyptic game, which I guess you could use an app framework to build. Um, but really, there's a lot of factors like state management and testing and rendering and routing and stores and so on. Um, one of the things we've done with Dojo is instead of, we started out with Redux, we ended up with something quite different where we basically have operations, processes, and transforms sort of separately delineated in a nice clear way. Because for the first like 10 Redux apps I saw, everyone did them differently. And everyone's opinion was quite different on where do you do this or where should you do that. So we really wanted to sort of fix that up. There's a lot to be said for rendering optimization. So not just components, but also like how you either use server-side rendering or static pre-rendering or build time rendering. 
Um, so Dojo has build time rendering built in on a component based level. Again, this isn't really a talk about Dojo, it's more just like these are things that I think are interesting that any framework could do or that should consider. So what we do is we've got basically the equivalent of Gatsby or Nuxt in some ways. You can do like a static site generation. So the Dojo website, dojo.io, is, you know, gets 100 out of 100 on Lighthouse because it ships no JavaScript by default. Uh, well, I think there's an include for Google Analytics, which I don't know why we do that, but we do. Um, we don't track. We just want to know if people actually visited the site or not. So we know, like, when people say, how many people use Dojo, we're like, well, I guess this number. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's this common pattern where you, you see that, right? So, um, so to sort of summarize, um, the world in this movie yesterday, the world had forgotten about the Beatles, Coca-Cola, I'm assuming Pepsi sponsored the movie. They'd forgotten about Harry Potter because it was a Universal movie, not a Warner Brothers movie. And, they'd f and the world has also not forgotten about React. Sadly, though, Tinder and Ryanair still exist. So... Um, so someday React's popularity will decrease, and we only have to look at history to see that. So this is the curve on Google Trends of jQuery. It came out in 2006. It peaked around 2011, which was actually earlier than I expected. But based on this curve, it still has about 30% of interest that it had at its peak, which is pretty shocking to me. Uh, but what's funny is Stefan was telling me, oh, Stefan, where are you? Anyway, he was telling me he was working on something the other day for the conference, and he used jQuery randomly because it was fast. And he asked on Twitter like for a slider plugin or something. He got like 50 responses. And he thought people were just going to troll him, but they gave him actual genu genuine feedback quickly, which meant there's a lot of people out there who still know and use jQuery. So even though jQuery is not popular, not the thing anyone really chooses by default to build an app, if you need to do something quick and hack it together or something small, um, and you know how to use it, why not? And again, it's kind of like, use the tools that solve your job, not the thing that's cool, and don't feel stupid for doing what you want. But today, there are a lot of incredible tools, alternatives to React. Some of them are better in some ways. There's a lot of alternatives we can look at to survive the apocalypse, and this is not it. Um, love the fire animation. I've never gotten to use it so many times in one talk, legitimately, in my life. <laughs> But these are three, but they're just three I picked. And I picked Dojo because I work on it. I think it's really good. But I love the work that the Stencil and Svelte teams do as well. But I could have talked about Preact or Vue 3 once Vue 3 comes out and we know what it is, finally. Um, I'm, I'm joking because rewriting is really, really hard. It took us five years to decide what Dojo 2 was going to be. And then since then, we've released versions 3, 4, 5, and 6, like any modern framework. So um, that's a good thing, right? So, or. You can get a, a tinfoil hat and a mask, and you can avoid this impending apocalypse. And um, it's not as cool as mine, but I think that one might actually work better. I'm not sure. But I don't think you could see out of that one either. Um, just real briefly, a uh, few things I work on. Work on uh, at SitePen, we do a nice podcast called TalkScript, talkscript.fm. I also organize a conference called HalfStack, and we had our first one in Vienna last month, and we're going to do it again next September has a similar vibe to this conference, but it's talks similar to mine, I would say. Um, but it, it's a very fun conference if you want to go. And then I work with SitePen, which has been doing JavaScript consulting for nearly 20 years. And thanks for listening.